Good evening. My name is Shirley Medill, and I will be speaking about the work of Robert Hull and the ways in which this extraordinary artist is considered a rebel and an iconoclast in Canadian art. I also wanted to say that I am honoured and also humbled to have been able to author this book, Robert Hull, Life and Work, and I also want to express my deepest gratitude to him for his gener generosity of time and allowing me to disrupt his life this past year. <laughs> As an artist, curator, educator, and critic, Robert Hull has played a pivotal role in bridging the gap between contemporary Indigenous art and contemporary Canadian art through synthesizing contemporary art trends and Indigenous traditions. He has created change in public museums and galleries. He has raised awareness of issues associated with cultural appropriation and challenged the government on numerous political issues affecting Indigenous peoples. Hull's journey has not been one without opposition. Born in 1947 in St. Boniface, Manitoba, his early childhood was spent in the extended family home at Sandy Bay, where he was immersed in Soto culture. Hull was forced to attend a Catholic mission-run residential school where he was removed from his family, the Soto language, and its spiritual traditions. The first thing that makes Robert Hould's work iconoclastic is his ability to reconcile indigenous traditions with modern art, often within a politically charged context. In the summer of 1969, he worked as a summer student at the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, now known as Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada. He joined First Nations protests against a federal government policy paper known as the 1969 White Paper, which called for an end to federal fiduciary responsibility for First Nations special status. At the time, Hull was studying art both at the University of Manitoba and McGill University, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Education. While studying art history and engaging in studio classes, who became interested in the work of international abstract artists, including Piet Modrian, Frank Stella, and Barnett Newman. In the early 1970s, who produced abstract paintings inspired by contemporary abstract art and also Ojibwe designs, like those he found in the book Ojibwe Crafts. His work, Red is Beautiful, where two diagonal geometric forms in shades of red and pink set against a flat red background converge was inspired by geometric designs used in traditional Ojibwe woven bags. In 1980, Hull traveled to The Hague and Amsterdam, where he encountered Barnett Newman's painting Cathedra. He found that color field painting and its ability to evoke strong emotional and spiritual reactions as experienced with Newman's work was perfectly suited to communicating his indigenous spirituality combined with a veneration for Christianity which he learned at residential school. Such color field influences can be seen in Parfleshes for the Last Supper a series of 13 paintings that combine two diametrically opposed ideologies, Christianity and Hull's Soto heritage. Each painting echoes the shape of a traditional medicine parflesh and symbolizes one of the 12 apostles and Jesus Christ. Made of handmade paper, folded and painted with acrylic, stitched with porcupine quills, they incorporate Soto symbols such as the morning star. Work produced by Indigenous artists at this time was not considered part of any style associated with contemporary art. Hull's synthesis broke with this tradition. Another iconoclastic component of Robert Hull's practice is how he changed this country's museums and public art galleries. Hull's curatorial career began in 1977 with his appointment as the first Indigenous curator of contemporary Indian art at the Canadian Museum of Man, now known as the Canadian Museum of History. The museum had an extensive collection of Indigenous art, but previously had not had any staff with expertise 
on indigenous knowledge. Despite resistance from museum authorities, Houle proposed purchases of work by contemporary indigenous Canadian artists, including Carl Beam and others. After three years at the museum, where Houle witnessed how indigenous ceremonial objects like the one shown on the screen were handled as ethnographic objects and without reverence, he became troubled. Houle stated, quote, I realized that artistically and aesthetically, I was in hostile territory. There was no place to exhibit the contemporary works I bought for the museum, and I just could not accept that. As a practicing artist, what I made had to be relegated to the realm of anthropology." End quote. In the summer of 1980, Houle handed in his resignation, a pronounced refusal to condone the museum's spiritual transgressions against sacred objects and indigenous knowledge. Houle's action was disruptive and made national headlines and would later come to mark the year 1980 as a pivotal moment in the post-colonial history of North American visual art. Houle then determined that the best way to promote indigenous art and representation was as an artist. However, he continued to be a curator and was responsible for two landmark exhibitions. New work by a new generation, shown at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in 1982, and Land Spirit Power, First Nations at the National Gallery of Canada a decade later in 1992. Houle participated in the exhibition New Work by a New Generation with this painting, Punkstick. Co-curated by Bob Boyer and Carol Phillips, New Work by a New Generation was the first major exhibition of contemporary indigenous art from Canada and the United States, and it situated an emerging generation of contemporary indigenous artists whose work is informed by their history and culture. This was a radical departure from previous conceptions of indigenous art often associated with traditional practices, such as the Woodland School, which is established by Norvell Morso. However, who would speak out about what he described as being segregated in the show as solely an indigenous artist, aspiring that his work be considered mainstream. Some indigenous artists believed Hull's position on the matter denounced his heritage. But for Hull, a rebel and an activist, he was resisting what many public institutions, including the National Gallery, had practiced, in his words, cultural apartheid. In 1992, Houle led the exhibition Land Spirit Power that was co-curated by Diana Nemiroff and Charlotte Townsend Galt, which was significant in bringing an unprecedented level of mainstream recognition to indigenous art and prompted the integration of this art into contemporary art collections in museums across the country. In his influential essay for the show's catalog, who framed the contemporary artists within an art tradition that predates European settlement by thousands of years through the subject of land as a central theme. Hull's curatorial work has been critical in positioning indigenous art as part of contemporary art practice in art museums. Prior to his advocacy, indigenous artists were often exhibited in and associated with ethnographical museums. I now want to talk about the iconoclastic component of Houle's practice in deepening understanding of cultural appropriation. In his first solo exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 1990, Houle included this work, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians from A to Z. It documents the names of North American indigenous nations, many of which had vanished as a result of colonization. This work, resembling a library shelf with 26 sacred parfleshes upon which are stenciled letters of the alphabet corresponding to indigenous nations beginning with the Aztec and ending with the Zuni. The act of reading letters that represent names of indigenous nations speaks to cultural appropriation of and misinformation about indigenous cultures and histories found in books. In 1985, Houle was prompted to bring the issue of cultural appropriation to the fore after seeing the installation by German artist Lothar Baumgarten at the Art Gallery of Ontario. 
Baumgarten's work was called Monument for the Native People of Ontario and was meant to pay homage to eight nations of the province, the names inscribed above each of the arches on the walls surrounding the court. Hull was jolted by Baumgarten's lack of research in documenting the indigenous names and described the work as, I quote, romantic 20th century anthropology, end quote. He responded to the Baumgarten installation with Anishinaabe Walker Court in 1993, where he reappropriated Baumgarten's tribal names, placing them in quotation marks, as you can see in this photo, where the word Iroquois is in quotation marks, and reinscribing them on the court's outer walls. In 2014, after Frank Gehry's AGO renovation, who revisited the Walker Court with seven grandfathers, a stunning installation of seven ceremonial painted drums that symbolize the seven Anishinaabe sacred teachings. In conclusion, I want to talk about the disruptive component of Hull's practice during the 1980s and 90s in inflecting his work with a profoundly more political hue as a response to turbulent events affecting this country's indigenous communities. In the summer of 1988, when the Glenbow Museum organized The Spirit Sings, artistic traditions of Canada's first peoples to coincide with the Olympics in Calgary, historical objects were borrowed from national and international ethnographic collections. As shown here, the Cree Lubicon Lake Nation in Northern Alberta campaigned to boycott the exhibition. They had been resisting oil exploration in their traditional territory, and ironically, the federal government and the oil company Shell Canada were sponsors of the exhibit. In sympathy with the Lubicon, who produced Warrior Shield for the Lubicon, a work that transforms the lid of an oil drum into a shield with a painted abstract landscape. For 78 days in the summer of 1990, the Mohawk Nation of Kanasataki stood off against the Quebec Provincial Police and the Canadian Army in defense of a sacred burial ground in the town of Oka, Quebec, where a golf course was set to be built. The dispute was the first well-publicized violent conflict between First Nations and the Canadian government in the late 20th century. During the crisis, police and soldiers surrounded the same longhouse in Kanawaki where Hull had taught in 1972. In response, Hull created a window installation in his Toronto apartment, Mohawk Summer, in support of the Mohawk. Hull explained, quote, when that longhouse was surrounded, it really hit me. That's why I blocked my Queen Street studio window with banners and literally deprived myself of light so I could not paint." End quote. The banners with the words, land claim, longhouse, sovereign, and false face, face the street, as shown on this slide. To emphasize the conflict, the photograph by Greg Statz included a Toronto police car passing by. Now this presentation would not be complete without mentioning the seminal work Kanata that was done in 1992. During Hull's work on the exhibition Land Spirit Power, he encountered the painting The Death of General Wolfe done in 1770 by Benjamin West and it's owned by the National Gallery and it was displayed alongside a selection of indigenous objects. There was a pouch, a garter, and a hat band as worn by one of the indigenous soldiers on loan from the British Museum in London. While indigenous artists were taking control of their own representation in land spirit power, another part of the gallery, heritage, was being represented in a conventionally ethnographic way. Such irony was not lost on whole. The experience inspired the creation of Kanata, a controversial historical revisionism created during a tense period of constitutional deliberations in Canada around the Meech Lake Accord. Who felt First Nations were in parentheses, as sandwiched between two colonizing nations, the British and the French? Who appropriates the canonical image by West digitally 
painting only the regalia of a lone Delaware warrior. Flanked by blue and red, challenges the authority and ability of non-Indigenous artists to represent Indigenous experiences and asserts Indigenous people's control over their destinies. In June 2017, Canada Susquicentennial, who completed the triptych, Owen de Mowan, We Were Told, which continues the polemics that began with Kanata, with the Delaware warrior featured as the key founding witness reinforcing First Peoples on this land prior to Confederation. 2017 witnessed significant moves in art institutions across Canada, as well as in funding agencies such as the Canada Council for the Arts, to focus on the work of Indigenous artists and curators through special programs. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is working on establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in the country. The confluence is aligned with subjects that Hull has been discussing for over 40 years. Using modern, postmodern, and post-colonial critiques in his art, curatorial work, and teaching, he breaks the shackles of colonialism. He has disrupted outdated methods of exhibiting Indigenous art and created paths for future curators of Indigenous art. Art museums and galleries are hiring Indigenous curators. His work has inspired two generations of Indigenous artists to move bravely beyond traditional methods, embrace mainstream contemporary discourse, proactively challenge colonial narratives of art history, decolonize museum spaces, and readdress collection policies. Amidst all of these positive changes, Hull has led the way. His work a part of rewriting art and cultural history. Thank you. <laughs>